So hey, if you do have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Acts chapter 21. And uh, as uh, John just mentioned, we're in Resurgence, which is the title of our series through the book of Acts that we started back in September. And yes, there's still more to come. <laughs> it's a long series, but, but as we've been walking through the, this, this series, again, we're asking the question, what did the church look like originally 2,000 years ago when it started? What does that mean for us today and what it's supposed to look like today? And so we're learning a lot of things from their experience and the way God worked through the power of the Holy Spirit and what that means for us today. So when we've been going through this series, and as you know, as now we're coming to the, kind of the latter sections of the book of Acts, there's a lot of focus on Paul and his journey personally and what he's going through as he has chosen to follow Jesus with his life, to tell people about the gospel, and obviously that has led to him now literally having to put his life on the line. And so uh, last week, if you're here, we talked about Paul's incredible trust in God in his life and what that looked like. And now, now as we move forward, the very thing that we talked about last week that in the passage you look at last week at the beginning of chapter 21 was that there was a couple times that Paul was warned through the Spirit, don't go to Jerusalem. At least that's what people said. He was warned that there would be trouble for him. And he said, it doesn't matter, I'm still going because this is what God has laid out for my life. And so he went. And now we get to the point where he's gone. And so literally today, we're going to cover a lot of ground. We're only going to dive down at a couple points, but we're going to cover actually the end of chapter 21 all the way to, to chapter 26. So don't worry, we won't be here for three hours, okay? But we're going to cover a lot of ground because what happens in these chapters is there's three occurrences where Paul is basically making a defense of his life and primarily a defense of the gospel before different leaders. And each time that he does that, the centerpiece of what he's talking about is not him defending himself, it's him sharing the gospel. And so for Paul, everything about his life was always the gospel. So whatever context he was in, Paul had this commitment I am going to plant the seed of the gospel wherever I go, which, by the way, when you read through the book of Acts, the beautiful thing is that it wasn't a church planting strategy in Acts. It was a gospel planting strategy. They planted the gospel, and then churches came out of that. So he's planting the gospel wherever he goes. And this is important because today we're going to talk about the gospel and why, for you and I, if you're a follower of Jesus, our responsibility is to plant the gospel wherever we go with, who, with whoever we are with all the time in our life, just like Paul. And so we're going to talk about that, but we're going to take a couple dives down into Paul's defenses because he highlights certain things about the gospel that are important for us to remember. But before we get into that, I just want to kind of back up a little bit because this is really important depending on where your background is. But I want to just take just a moment to talk about what is the gospel. So we could literally be here for hours to explain it. And the reason I want to kind of bring clarity to this is because the gospel is much bigger than we kind of make it. If you're a Christian, this is kind of you. If someone asks you the gospel, normally this is what we say. Oh, it's Jesus came and died for my sins and rose from the dead so I could be with God forever. That's kind of the simplistic approach to the gospel. That is the gospel. That's a part of the gospel. But the gospel is a part of a bigger picture. And this is why it's so important in our culture today that we understand that the whole journey of human history is the gospel, which means good news. Because the gospel didn't start when Jesus came onto the planet. Did you know that? The gospel started back at the beginning of time in the garden with Adam and Eve. That's where it started. Because there's three main, if you want to break it down, three main mountain peaks. If you've been in a line, this is what we talk about in the line, the line seminar, to talk about, we align everything around the gospel. But there's three mountain peaks that highlight kind of human history and, and the gospel. The first one is creation, that God creates Adam and Eve, creates humanity, with his capacity to be in relationship with him. But as you know or don't know, in the garden, something went awry with Adam and Eve because they took on the role of God and tried to determine for themselves what was right and wrong, good and bad, which is only something that God does for us. And what happened is they lost access to the garden, access to the tree of life, and then ultimately access to God. So then from that mountain peak, we move into a valley that covers all of Israel's history. Israel's God's chosen people on the planet. And we go through how God chooses them and then how God blesses them and how he brings them out of slavery and how he gives them a land and how he warns them through prophets and he gives them kings. And all the while, if you read through the Old Testament, it doesn't work out very well for Israel because they keep doing what Adam and Eve did. They keep trying to be their own God and do their own thing. And God keeps pursuing and keeps pursuing and keeps pursuing. And then finally we get to the second mountain peak, which is where we usually land. And that's Jesus comes into the world. The God of the universe in human flesh comes. Jesus comes and he lives a perfect life. He dies on the cross for our sin, which kept us disconnected from God. And then he rises from the dead to demonstrate that his perfection. And now he has power over the sin and brokenness in our life and the death that ultimately we all face. So Jesus does that in that act. But then that's not the end of the story. 
Because you know where we're living right now? We're living, between, we're living in the valley between the second and the third mountain peaks because there's a third one. The third one is a new heaven and a new earth. It's God's restoration of all things. In fact, what lines the gospel underneath everything is one word, reconciliation. That God is reconciling everything, his creation, humanity, everything back to God through Jesus, his death on the cross, so that what? The ultimate goal of the gospel is not Jesus' death and resurrection. It's what that gets to us. That gets us to eternity where God renews all things, where once again we can be what he intended us to be, which is what? He will be our God and we will be his people and we will relate to him face to face as Adam and Eve did. Now that is, that's the gospel. So that means you and I are living in the middle of the gospel right now. And so that's why it always is about the gospel. It's about the good news of what God is doing. And that's why a lot of people are turned off by the gospel because we don't tell them the full story. If you don't start with creation, people don't know why they're here. They don't know what needs to be reconciled in their life. And so understanding the big picture, now we're going to dive down in, into Paul's defenses. And there's some things he highlights this morning that I want us to look at. So what I'm going to do is, because there's a lot of ground to cover, all the main passages are all going to be on the screen for you so you can follow along, but you can also track along in your, your Bibles as well. But there's three main categories, and then we'll break some things down from there. But we're going to look at Acts 22, Acts 24, Acts 26. But we're at, at, at looking at this. What is the gospel about? What does Paul say the gospel is about? What are the things he highlights when he defends himself? The first one is this. The gospel is about redeeming what is lost. So in Acts 22, is an interesting thing happens. So Paul does get arrested by the Jews. The very thing that was predicted to happen, happens. And now he's speaking to a group of Jews in Acts 22 and defending himself. So he's speaking to people who are like him. He's Jewish and have the background religiously. And he's talking about his past life and what he experienced in, in the life before he came to Christ. Listen to what he says to a group of Jews in Acts 22, verses 19 to 21. He says, And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So what's Paul doing? He's saying to a group of Jews, I used to be just like you. In fact, all of you know me. In fact, he was referring back to Acts chapter 7, where Stephen loses his life when he's telling the religious leaders about Jesus. And he says, I remember I'm the one standing there holding your garments while you're killing Stephen. I was just like you. I'm one of you. I'm a Pharisee. I'm a religious leader just like you. But my life has been transformed. Even though I was a hater of Jesus and a persecutor of the church, now look at what I'm doing. Now my life, I'm on trial, what? For following Jesus. He's demonstrating how radically changed his life is. How God has redeemed his past from being a murderer of Christians to be a follower of Jesus. What does that say to you and I? God redeems what is lost in our life. If, Paul, if, if Jesus can save Paul, Jesus can save anyone. That's what Paul's saying. And you and I have to hear that. That the gospel, and Paul diving down here, is reminding us that God redeems what's lost in our life. What does he redeem specifically? Well, let me highlight a few things that I think we need to be reminded of, of what God does as far as the good news of the gospel. God can redeem, first of all, our rebellious life. When we reject God, he continues to pursue us. When you know or have a knowledge of God and you turn and you do your own thing and you walk away and you reject God, God doesn't reject you. Now that doesn't work for us. We're like, wait a second. In fact, he does the opposite. When you reject him, you know what he does? He pursues you. He keeps coming after you. He won't let you go. And if, that's a reminder to us why. Because we're convinced that the way God works is that when we blow it, when we sin, when we fail, when we do something we know is wrong against God, God's response to us is not open arms, but it's closed, crossed arms as he looks down the end of his nose at us and says, oh, you blew it. Now you're gonna get it. Some of us, that's the way we, we approach God. We think that God is constantly mad at us. Every day of our life, God is so upset because I've blown it, which is not true. Luke chapter 15, there's a story that most of us are probably familiar. We call it the prodigal son. A better title for it is prodigal God because it has more to do with God than, about, than the son. It has to do with a father who, prodigal means in a sense reckless and generous, who recklessly gives a third of his wealth away to his son, hoping that his son will someday return to him. And when you get to the end of the story in verse 20, you, you see something that is meant for us to understand the heart of God for humanity. And that is you see a father who's not doing what you and I would expect a father to do when his son has basically ripped off all of his inheritance and he's wasted it all. He's turned his back on his dad. And what does it say? It says in verse 20 of Luke uh, 15, it says, and he rose 
And he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, if you've been in church, you've read that story, and that becomes kind of common. But you have to realize that's not what we think the default is. When somebody does something wrong, we would say justice demands that they pay for what they did. It does. But who paid for what we did? Jesus did. So how does the Father look at us? Not with crossed arms, not with indignation, but with love and compassion and acceptance. Why? Because Jesus died for us so that now he accepts us with open arms. So it doesn't matter, it means what, it doesn't matter what you've done in your life. God still is pursuing you. There isn't like the certain sin limitation that you reach and like, okay, God's now finally stopped pursuing me. No, he will pursue you until the very last breath of your life in this world. That's the nature of God. That's the way he works. So for us to be reminded that God redeems what is lost, which means even when we turn our back on him, he does not turn his back on us. He keeps pursuing us. And the second thing, God can also redeem our broken life. So when the circumstances of our lives destroy us, when there's difficulties, Psalm 147 verse 3 says this of God, he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. That means that God is not disconnected from our suffering. He's actually present. He knows the difficulties we go through. Now there is, there is a responsibility and a victimization in sin. We are both responsible and victims of our own doing in our lives. But there's this side that God understands that and God comes to people who are broken and suffering and marginalized and he reaches out to them, not with judgment or pointing the finger, but with compassion. Because ultimately God's compassion and kindness is what turns people towards him. So if you've read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, you will see these encounters that Jesus has with absolutely broken people who have no hope whatsoever. In fact, that's where Jesus spends most of his time, is with those kind of people. And what's interesting, and I don't know if this is intentional, but maybe it's because pride, guys, got a, guys like me, we have pride issues, and so there's, there's a vulnerability with women to be more honest about their brokenness than guys. But if you read through the Gospels, you will, you will come across profound encounters Jesus had with women who were broken in their life. Now, this extends to all humanity, not just women, but the highlight ones that you really, you will see is that we, we if you're familiar with the story, so there's, we, we give these women names, but they, there's no name mentioned, but we give them names. One of them, we call her the woman at the well. And the reason we call her that is because Jesus encounters her in the middle of the day. She's a Samaritan woman who is a half-breed to Jews, who is a promiscuous woman in her culture, so she goes in the heat of the day to get water from the well because she's hoping no one will be there. But guess who's there? Jesus is there. And then Jesus violates cultural norms, gender norms, religious norms. He just violates everything that everybody said is you're not supposed to do. Why? Because this woman was broken. This woman had no idea who God was. She was confused. And Jesus, in a few moments, encounters her in such a way, she literally, within just a brief conversation with Jesus, goes back to her village and says, you gotta come see this guy. He's told me everything I've ever done. And at the end of the passage, it's beautiful. They, the crowd comes from the city and meets Jesus, and then they say to Jesus, we, don't, you know, we no longer have to believe what she has said. Now we believe her for ourselves because we've seen you. Why? Because Jesus encountered a broken woman. How about another woman? The woman caught in adultery. Don't give her a name. But she's known by her sin, even though Jesus has set her free. So if you don't know the story, the religious leaders catch a woman in the act of adultery, bring her before Jesus. The law demands that she be killed. That's what the law says. And so they're all ready to kill her. They're ready to catch Jesus. And Jesus says, okay, all you perfect guys, go ahead, pick up the stone, and you can start throwing. And then one by one, they peel off. And then it's just Jesus and this woman. And what does Jesus say to her? He says, I don't condemn you either. He says, in fact, because I don't condemn you now, you can go leave the life of sin you're living, and now you can go free. And he sets her free. Or the woman that we don't even really give her name. We just know that the woman who anointed Jesus' feet when Jesus was invited to a religious leader's house and there was a banquet and they're sitting, all the, the, the invited guests are all around a table and most likely they were in a courtyard area and out of kind of pity or charity, they would invite the, the marginalized and the poor from the community to come to the banquet but not to participate. They could line the walls but they couldn't participate until all of the guests were done and whatever scraps were left on the table as the guests left, then those who were in the shadows could come out and they could get, they could get food. And so in the middle of that banquet, if you don't remember what happens, this woman violates everything. She steps out of the shadows. She goes over to Jesus and she anoints his feet with her tears and wipes her, his feet with her hair. And can you imagine? Everybody in the room is like, this woman does it. She's not allowed to do that. She's a woman. She's marginalized. She's poor. She wasn't invited. What is she doing? And Jesus stops them all and basically rebukes the guy who owns the house and says, by the way, 
when you've sinned a lot, what do you need? You need a lot of forgiveness. This woman's forgiven. So we go on and on and on in stories. It just underscores this reality in the worst moment of your brokenness and your sin and your failure. God shows up. That's the truth of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is that you can't fix yourself. You can't repair yourself. You're broken. And Jesus knows that, and that's why he continues to pursue you. He kept pursuing Paul. And finally, he got an intersection with him on the road to Damascus and got Paul's attention, and Paul realized his life was supposed to be about something different. See, if you and I were to realize that, that God actually redeems all things, that means even when we walk away from God, he pursues us. When we're broken, he comes to comfort us and to bring healing to us. And then there's a third one. God also redeems our wasted life. What do I mean by that? See, God offers another chance to people who are apathetic to the gospel. It doesn't mean people have necessarily rejected the gospel, and this is what I want to read a passage from Revelation in a moment. But I think one of the dangers is when you get, and we'll talk about this in the fall, when you and I get enough of the gospel to make us feel comfortable, but not enough of the gospel to kill us, we become inoculated. That's what's happened. It's just like when you go and you get an, an immunization, you get inoculated, you get a little bit of a disease, but not enough to, make, to kill you. It might make you sick a little bit, but it's, so it makes you immune to that disease. When we don't get the fullness of the gospel, we become immune to it. And when we become immune to it, the Bible describes our condition. It's called being lukewarm. I'm going to read a passage in a moment because one of the times that, one of the things that we have a tendency to do is we'll go to the Bible and we'll pick and choose verses that, that do make sense, but we'll pull them out of the context that they're in and then it loses the significance of what's there and we change the meaning. And in fact, verse 20 of what I'm going to read in, in Revelation chapter 3 is actually one of these verses that we quote or people quote all the time and they quote it out of context. So the, the, the first few verses are really pretty brutal. This is Jesus. He's talking to through through the Apostle John, he's speaking to churches, a number of churches, and he's speaking to one church in a city called Laodicea. And these are, this is a church. This means this is speaking to people who have received the gospel. But listen to what he says to him, says to them. He says this, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would, you either co uh, uh, would it that you are either cold or hot? So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Aren't you feeling encouraged so far? Verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may be clothed yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. And here it is, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Now, I've grown up in the church and I've heard that verse quoted over and over and over again in the context of somebody who doesn't know Jesus. But what's the context of Revelation 3? Jesus is speaking to a group of people who already have the gospel. And he says to them, you haven't got it yet. Because you think you're wealthy, you're fine. That's really what they're saying. We're good. And Jesus says, you're not good. You haven't got the fullness of the gospel. But what does he do in response to that? He says, you need to repent. And when you repent, guess what? I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking again and again and again and again and again until you open and you let me into your heart. That's the gospel. Even when you know the gospel and you don't really live out the gospel, God keeps coming after you. He keeps pursuing you because he won't be satisfied until he gets all of you, not just a portion of you. And that's the way that God works in our lives. So there's a second thing. So we know the gospel is about redeeming what is lost. The second main thing that Paul talks about, we look at Acts chapter 24, is that the gospel is about resurrecting all. So in verse 24, so now Paul moves on from the Jews. He gets handed over to the Romans, and now he goes before what we consider the governor. His name's Felix. And now he's again, now he's defending himself against a Roman official. And in this encounter, this is what he says to a Roman official who is obviously a non-Jew. He says in Acts 24, verses 14 and 15, he says, but this I confess to you that according to the way, that's what Christians were known at the time, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. Verse 15, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. 
So in the middle of the gospel, Paul says, by the way, this, is, this thing called resurrection is something that's going to happen for everybody. That means people who know Jesus and people who don't know Jesus are going to go on forever from this life. That means that someone can go on forever with Jesus or forever apart from Jesus, depending on how they accept and receive the gospel and know who Jesus is. Why is that important? Because that's at the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel is God doesn't want anybody to perish. God doesn't want anybody to, to be separated from him forever. And that's important that Paul is highlighting to a Roman official, you're, you're a Gentile, I'm a Jew, and by the way, there are people who are just and people who are unjust. The unjust will not be with God, the just will. What is it just unjust? Well, just has to do with justification, which means you and I are justified before God by who? Jesus. His death on the cross takes my sin and my failure and my stain and my brokenness and it puts it on Jesus. Jesus pays for it. So then when I stand before God, what am I? I'm pure, I'm washed, I'm whole, I'm righteous. Why? Because of what Jesus did. So I'm justified. But what if, because what is being unjustified? Unjustified is what Adam and Eve decided to do. I'll determine for my life what's best for me apart from God. I'll do it my way. And I'll do my best to do what I can to be self-justified, which means good enough. So that's what, a, what's, that's what, when you're not justified, you're unjust means that you're trying your best and in your failure, you're trying your best. And here's the problem with that. The standard of access to God is perfection. That's why Jesus is the standard. And that's why we can't get it on our own. So when we stand before God someday and said, hey, look at I really tried hard. I only messed up a few times, a few thousand times maybe, but I tried really hard. And God says, here's the righteousness of Jesus. Here's what you did, and this is what you thought would get you in, but you didn't embrace this. That's scary. What is, what is the outcome for that group of people? Well, Revelation chapter um, 20, verse 12 says this. It says, And I saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in them according to what they had done. And we can go on in the passage because that's at the point we start moving towards now that they're all cast into the lake of fire and separated from God, from God forever. Now, why do we talk about that? Because that's a truthful element of the gospel. Now, let me, let me explain. There's, there's, the motivation in that should come from those of us who are believers, not for those who are non-believers. Let me just make this clear. The worst motivation for salvation is hell. I want you to understand this. So many times, we say, well, you better get saved or you're going to go to hell. Anybody heard that phrase before? Oh, people come in droves. Do they? What are they getting, what are they getting saved to? Nobody. They just don't want to go to hell. And when you and I present the gospel that way, you know what it does? It sets Jesus up as the booby prize. Well, I guess I have to embrace Jesus because I don't want to go to hell. If you are so in love with Jesus, hell is not even a factor for you. Who's a hell a factor for? People who don't know Jesus. Which means if the people you live by, the people you work with, the people you go to school with, if they don't know Jesus, what are they? They're unjust. They're trying to earn their way somehow into being what they're supposed to be or access to God, and they can't do it. And meanwhile, you're under the righteousness of Jesus, and you're in position to tell them the good news of what Jesus can do for them so that they get to choose Jesus and then, by the way, avoid hell, but not choose Jesus because somehow I'm afraid of going to hell. Does that make sense? That's why Paul dives down and says, listen, there's just and there's unjust, and by the way, all of them are gonna be resurrected. The, the unjust just don't go away, and so there's a lot at stake for us. There's a lot at stake for the people around us that Jesus loves deeply, so there's a resurrection of the just, the resurrection of the unjust. Moving on. So then there's a, a third reality of what the gospel is about. And that is the gospel is about reaching everyone. Acts 26. So Paul's already made a defense against some Jews, a defense before a Roman official, and now new guy comes, comes into power, and now we have a guy named Fel uh, Festus, and he has a friend, a king named Agrippa, and they want to have audience with Paul, and so Paul comes, and now he's making another defense with these guys. And in this, in this thing, what we discover from what Paul says is that God wants to reach everyone with the gospel. Listen to what 
happens. Acts chapter 26, verse 22 and 23. Paul says this, this day I have uh, had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. Verse 23, that the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. I want you to understand what's going on here. When Paul says this, this comes across very offensive, particularly to King Agrippa. If you go on in the passage, it gets to the end, and Agrippa says to Paul, do you seriously think in this short amount of time you can make me become a Christian? And Paul goes, yeah. He goes, apart from the change that I wear right now, you betcha, absolutely, that's why I'm here. And so what's happening here is Paul's demonstrating the very thing that we've learned as we've gone through Acts. If you go back to Acts, remember Acts 10 and 11? Remember when Peter was only amongst the Jews, and then God gives him a vision and says what was unclean is, is, is clean. Don't call things that I've said are clean unclean. And then Peter ends up in Cornelius' house, a Gentile, and that whole family gets saved as a way of God saying the gospel is for everyone. And now Paul's doing that in his defense, which is such an important reminder to us because we will say the gospel's for everyone, but we don't believe the gospel's for everyone. And there's three, I think, categories that, these, the fall, that, that our struggles fall into. The first one is this. Now, this may seem basic, but the gospel's for sinners. You're like, yeah, I get that. No, I don't think we get that. The gospel's actually for sinners, and that means for people who commit sin, small sins, medium sins, big sins, which, by the way, sin is sin to God, so one sinner is the same as another sinner to God. Sin. It's for sinners. But listen to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. See, you and I have to understand there's two things we struggle with. We look at other people's sins and we disqualify them, and we look at our own sins and we disqualify ourselves. But listen to what Paul writes. He says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? But do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor uh, adulterers, nor men practice, who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Then verse 11, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. That's good news. The gospel's for sinners. Why is that important? Well, let's start with one side of the coin, and that is something happens when you, the longer you follow Jesus, we have a tendency to become more judgmental of people's sins. The things that we used to struggle with, the major things we secretly struggle with, we point out at everybody else. And we use those as disqualifiers for them because they've committed, in our minds, we won't say it, but the unpardonable sin, which is not true because God loves sinners and the gospel's for sinners. So let me just ask you this question because this is one of the things that's probably gonna be a surprise to many of us when we stand before God and enter into eternity with him, but let's ask this of, this of yourself. Are there washed, sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revelers, swindlers in your version of heaven? See, for some of us, there aren't because all we see is sin. We miss the whole point of what Paul said was verse 11. You were washed. That means there's gonna be a lot of people who used to be this in this life and are no longer that because they gave their lives to Jesus. They stand before God washed. And so that means somebody that you marginalized and you pushed to the side because of a sin may be standing right next to you before the throne of God because they were washed just like you. And that means you and I have never have the right to disqualify somebody from the gospel because of their sin. Never. And so whatever it is that the sin that is most detestable to you, God doesn't disqualify that person from the gospel. So we need to look at it differently. The other side of the coin is for us. Some of us don't believe we're washed. Especially if you've do dealt with a habitual sin in your life, you keep going back to it and you want to break the cycle and you can't break the cycle and you keep going back. And the cycle of shame and guilt and condemnation keeps going round and round and round and round. And you feel stuck and you feel like God po could not possibly love me but you have to submit yourself again to him. Why? Because you're supposed to be washed. This is the beauty. When we confess our sin, the Bible tells us well, that Jesus is faithful. He'll cleanse us and he'll purify us from all that is unrighteous, which means I am clean before God. Just let that sink in. 
I'm kind of clean. I'm still a little bit dirty behind the ears. You know, I've got some issues. No, if we confess our sin, then God's promise is that we are washed white as snow. That when God looks at us, he sees what? The righteousness of Jesus. So we are now in relationship with God. Some of us need to hear that. Because the enemy just wants to keep you in that cycle. Just round and round and round. You're never going to get out of this. You're always going to be stuck. And then Jesus comes along and says, no, by my blood, I've washed you. And I'll continue to wash you over and over and over and over again. That's the way that God works. That's the good news of the gospel for us. We have been washed, therefore we are right with God. Second thing, the gospel's for. If it's for everybody, it's for sinners. And also, it's for outsiders. The gospel's for those who are different from us or different from you, the outsiders. I read this passage a couple weeks ago, but let me read it again. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Paul reminds us that at one point, we were all outsiders. He says, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders, which, by the way, is the majority of us in the room. You were called the uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from the citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in the world without God and without hope, but now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Isn't that good news? We're all outsiders. We all start as outsiders. And when we get become insiders, it isn't because we did anything. It's because Jesus brought us in. That's so significant. Because we always draw lines of who's in and who's out. We draw a line of who's in and who's out when it comes to salvation. We draw a line of who's in and who's out according to ethnicity. We draw lines according to what we think is acceptable and not acceptable. We do it all the time. We make these judgment calls. But the gospel is for everyone, which means the gospel is for everyone, including people who are different than us. Why is this significant? You know, please hear my heart on this, okay? Hear my heart on this. There are a group of people in our culture right now that are definitely outsiders, culturally. It's immigrants. And I need you to hear me. I am not making a political statement, and I do, want, do not want anybody to be offended by what I'm going to say. Okay, because this is important. Because I'm convinced what's happening in our country in terms of immigration grieves the heart of God. Now, already some of you are on either side of the coin right now. You're already getting information. Please hear me. Okay? This is not a political stance. This is not supporting Democrat or Republican, conservative or liberal. I want you to hear what's going on. The problem that we have in our country with immigration is the same problem we have with everything, especially I'm referring to Christians, is God had asked us to live our lives through the lens of the gospel, to live our lives through the lens of the kingdom of God, which looks at the world differently than the powers of the world look at the world. And we, even as Christians, are guilty of aligning ourselves more with political parties and political candidates and liberal conservative than we are sometimes with Jesus. And that we're in danger of doing that right now. Which, by the way, everybody will be, you'll be shocked when you get to heaven and you won't be able to put a label on Jesus. Not a Republican, not a Democrat, not a liberal, not a conservative, not a progressive, not a whatever you want to call it. He's none of those. Why? Because he supersedes those. There is a kingdom that is bigger than the kingdom in this world. And that's the kingdom lens that we have to look at things through, not through a political persuasion. And here's where we've gotten to in our country. Because we have so politicized what we call an issue, we have not seen the heart of God for people. Because now we have said there's insiders and outsiders when it comes to people coming in our, into our country, whether legally or illegally. We have set that up, and here's the problem with that. This is, what, this is what grieves me so much, is I'm convinced when I look at our political system, we have lost our heart for people. Immigration's not an issue. Immigration's a person. You need to hear this because this is what's happened. Both sides of this argument, in my estimation, are absolutely wrong. You know why? Because it's no longer about people. You know what it's about? It's about power. It's about winning the battle of power. It's not about people. And hear me, our system is broken. It's not working for anybody. And it needs to be reformed. But our politicians are not doing anything to get us any closer to that. 
So in the middle, this is what just, I know it grieves the heart of God. A couple weeks ago, many of you saw the picture of a father with his daughter's arm around him as they died trying to cross the Rio Grande to get into the United States. And of course, one side of the coin said, this is horrible. Look at what the policies of the current administration have done, which I thought it's horrible that anybody would put this on television because you don't care about that father and that daughter. You're just using them as a pawn, what? To gain power. And I'm convinced that's not a gospel perspective. God loves people. And it doesn't matter what border they're born over or what color their skin is. And the beauty of our country is God has, has blessed us not with financial wealth. God's blessed us with the gospel and the freedom to pursue Jesus. And many places in the world, they don't have that. And they come into our country, whether legal or illegal. And when it comes to the gospel, I don't care. Because now they have an opportunity to access the gospel, which will save their soul, not draw a line of where they were born and where they should and shouldn't be. Hear me on this. Don't please do not get offended on either side of this because if you do, you've missed the point because I challenge anybody that takes a stance and say this is God's stance and it goes to either extreme, please read the Bible. Please submit to the Holy Spirit and realize there's an answer that's better and bigger than either political party or either stance and it's the one that we as Christians must take in the world because it's not working. So let me just share a story where this really became evident to me. So, of course, this was a lot closer to 9-11 than it is now. But when we were in Oregon, it's probably about 10 years or, or so ago that this happened. And so we lived in Newburgh, Oregon, and I've, I shared about this. And Newburgh is, is, is very vanilla. That's probably the best way to put it, okay? It's not very diverse. Um, Oregon as a state is not very diverse. And so um, when somebody of color comes into Newburgh, everybody knows them because everybody else is white, and, you, and they stand out. And then when somebody else comes into, into Newburgh who's not only a person of color, but they come from a country that we are not necessarily on good terms with and is predominantly Muslim, then they stick out even more. So there was a couple that came into our community. They're from Somalia. And they were struggling to, to make ends meet and trying to find ways to, to get jobs. And so the, the, his, the wife, she actually started a sewing business. She got people to give her a sewing machine, and so she started repairing people's clothing instead of them throwing them out or donating them she was repairing people's clothing the husband was trying his hardest and and so some friends of ours in our church they they got to know them in fact i think the way that they they met is is our friend in the church met the wife on the street just saw her and then through, through some, some resources in our city got to know her and so they s approached us one day and they said listen this couple would love to have dinner with you now they're muslim and they're from somalia and their skin color is dark Everybody knows that they don't belong in Newburgh. I'm like, absolutely, we would love to. And they said, they want to make Somali food for you. I'm like, I'm in, we're in. So Kim and I went for two or three hours right now, and we spent the evening with this, this couple. And as we're sharing, we, we prayed before the meal, and they prayed to Allah, and we prayed to Jesus. And we were all good. Nobody was arguing or anything. And so they started sharing their story. You know, what's the default? Oh, you're from Somalia, you're Muslim. You must be a terrorist, right? That's the default, especially put t go a decade ago. That was the assumption that most all of us would make. And then they started to share their story. She started to share their story. When, when civil unrest first started in Somalia, when, when the, 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 the government started to collapse and war broke out, she went to school one morning and war broke out in the middle of the school day and the fighting was so intense, she never went home. Just think about that for a moment. You go to work one day or your child goes to school and the fighting becomes so intense just out of nowhere that you are completely disconnected from your home and your family. And then she began to explain the journey of one place to another and then her husband, a very similar situation of what he walked through and then through multiple, multiple refugee camps until finally they were able to get asylum in the United States and they came into Dearborn, Michigan and they were there for a while and they struggled and I don't know how they ended up in Newburgh, Oregon. But as we're sitting there, I knew exactly why they ended up in Newburgh, Oregon. To hear the gospel, which they weren't going to hear in Somalia. And so they came, became really good friends with the friends in church, and we got to know them a little bit. But I was convinced, I know why they came to the United States. Because they would be sitting in this living room with four Christians who loved them, showing them that there is a God, his name is Jesus, and he gave his life for them. See, that's the beauty of when God shakes up the planet and people start moving from one country to the next. It unlocks the potential of the gospel.
So what is immigration, whether legal or illegal? It's God's opportunity for the gospel. Yeah, do we need to fix our system? Yeah. But in the meanwhile, what's our position as believers? God loves people. And when they come into our borders and have contact with them, I'm not going to ask them what their status is. I'm going to ask them what their soul is about. Because that's the most important thing. So please, I love you, but do not email me, okay? <laughs> um, this is, I'm not trying to debate. I'm just saying please read the scriptures and the Bible before we get into, I, don't, I won't get into political uh, arguments with you. Anyway, moving on, last thing. <clears throat> the gospel is for, obviously, sinners, for outsiders, and then this is even easier than the last one. The gospel is for enemies. It gets easier, doesn't it? The gospel is for everyone. That means the gospel is for people that don't like you and you don't like. Isn't that good news? You're like, oh, man, I was hoping there would be some little qualifier I could get away with here. So Jesus reminds us, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 45. He says, you have heard that the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Verse 44, but I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven, for he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. Remember, Paul is standing before Gentile rulers, Roman rulers, who hated Jews, and the Jews hated the Romans, and Paul's presenting the gospel. Why? Because he knows that God loves Felix, Festus, and Agrippa as much as he loves Paul his enemies. And this is so important. If the gospel is for everyone, the gospel is for our enemies, the people that we don't like, the people that don't like us. And maybe you're like me. I, I know as I was working on this message this week, many times I'll get to certain points and I'll reflect and say, God, what's going on in my life in this area? And I asked the question this week, God, who's my enemy? Because, you know, I start thinking, I'm thinking, I'm pretty good with everybody. I don't, as far as I know, nobody hates me. I hope not. But I'm just thinking, I'm like, I'm good. Like, I can check the enemy box off and move on. And then God just says, whoa, 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 you, 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 have, a, you have an enemy. I'm like, what? I'm like, I have an enemy. Who's my enemy? And then what happened about five weeks ago came back to me. So Harold, who's our, our media director and facility director, we were out running some errands, and I was driving. And we were on L.A. Avenue, and we were trying to pull into a parking lot where, where, the, where a bank is. And, and as I was in the middle lane and I couldn't get to the right lane, I had to get over quickly to get into the parking lot. And so... I kind of sped up a little bit, and there was a truck in the lane next to me that I had, could get around, and I just kind of squeezed in in front of him, and it was close. It wasn't, like, dangerously close, but it was probably a little bit close, but the guy in back, in behind me had no problem with what I did. It was the guy in front of me who was on a motorcycle, and so I slipped in in front of the truck, and as I slipped in front of the truck, the guy in the motorcycle slams his brakes on and turns around and just starts screaming. He stops right in the middle. He stops traffic right on L.A., and just starts screaming at me. I'm like, what in the world? I'm looking at Harold like, what did I just do? I'm like, he, his head was turned. Did he have eyes in the back of his head or something? And so I'm like, I don't, I don't know. So we, I turn into the parking lot, and Harold and I are just kind of scratching. It's like, what in the world just happened? And so as I go around the bank, I'm going to, to go across further into the parking lot, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this motorcycle flies right in front of me and slams his brake on. He's literally like five feet from my front, front bumper. And he stands there and just gives me the most creative, most unbelievable fluency in four-letter words that I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> he's just going off, and he's screaming, and I'm looking at Harold, and I'm going, okay, wh what did I do? And so he sat there, and we sat there, and he's staring at us, and the, for a moment I thought, hey, there's two of us. <laughs> and I thought, that's, that's not the gospel lens you're supposed to look through, right? He was a scary-looking dude, right? So finally, he, he looks at me, and I said, I put my hands, I said, I'm sorry. Whatever I did, I'm sorry. And so he drives off screaming, just yelling. And so we go on our way, and so I'm like, the rest, the rest of my day was ruined. I'm like, what did I do? And then if you're like me, this is what happened. About an hour or two later, I'm like, man, what did I do? And then I'm like, that guy was an idiot, <laughs> right? That guy was a jerk. What a jerk. I didn't do anything wrong. And so I'm building this case of what a horrible person he is. About three or four hours later, Harold was out running some other errands, and I get this picture sent to my phone. And it, Harold says, you're not going to believe who stopped in front of me. He takes a picture. It's the same guy stopped at a light right in Harold's behind him. And just for a moment, I'll be honest. I thought, Harold, step on it. You know, that's just for a moment. Okay, just being honest, right? Come on. You're human too, right? And so then I'm telling Kim the story later. And she goes, I know that guy. I saw him. <laughs> 
he was yelling at another car like a couple weeks after this happened. And then I kid you not, like five days ago, I'm driving to the church, I'm coming down LA and I'm turning on Tapo Street to come down and guess who stopped at the light? I'm not kidding. You're like, oh, Pastor John, you're seeing things. No. So in the middle of that, God says, you do have an enemy. And ever since Tuesday, I've been trying to almost every day pray for this guy. I don't know his name. I've called him Motorcycle Man. That's all I know. That's all I know. If, if you're a Motorcycle Man, please forgive me, okay? If he's your relative. But he's in our city, and I'm convinced that somehow three people have crossed his path four times in the last month. I think God's doing something. So I'm praying for my enemy. I don't even know his name. But I'm praying that someday he, my enemy comes to know Jesus. Because Jesus loves that man more than I ever will, but he loves that man as, loves, as much as he loves me. Because <laughs> uh, he loves our enemies. So I'm going to ask the worship team they come and join me because as we conclude, I know there's, we cover a lot of ground. And there's a lot of things, but I, I want us to understand this. We're always looking for outcomes from the book of Acts. What does this mean for us? What does this mean that how our life's supposed to look? Well, Paul is a great example of what somebody looks like as a follower of Jesus. And whether he is on trial for his life or he's walking into a city and engaging people, it was always the gospel for Paul. He always planned on what? Planting a seed of the gospel that God would grow in the lives of people. And that means for us, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to plant the gospel always. Because why? The gospel redeems what is lost and broken in our lives. Ultimately, there will be a resurrection for all, the just and the unjust. And I want there to be more just than unjust. And ultimately, the gospel's for everyone because God loves people. And if we live that out, then no matter where we find ourselves, we are going to do what Paul did. We're going to try to find a way to communicate the love of Jesus, the good news of the gospel, and what God wants to do in the lives of people so that God might grow the seed that we plant so that that person can experience relationship with Jesus and be reconciled back to God. Let's pray. Jesus, as we come now and we sing this song that reminds us of your death and your resurrection and the victory that you bring for us and the victory you bring for all of us, Lord, would you by your spirit now, would you infuse us with courage? Lord, I know when Paul stood in front of whoever he stood in front of, he didn't do that under his own power. He did that under the power of your spirit because you gave him courage to do that. So I pray, Lord, whether it's with our family, with our neighbors, with our coworkers, with other students around us, with whoever it is, would you give us the courage to, in love, present the truth of who you are the picture of what the gospel is, that God, that you're pursuing every person because you love them and you want them to know you, that you want them to be reconciled back to you so that they would experience the fullness of resurrection, which is life with you forever. So Holy Spirit, would you come and would you fill us? And as we sing, Lord, would you remind us of the victory that you've given us that would again give us courage to plant the gospel wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand together as we